He is risen. He is risen indeed. Indeed. Say it again, Mike. He is risen. He Amen. Is risen indeed. indeed. Thank you, Mike. You know, today's lesson is obviously about the resurrection. So he is risen. He is risen. Thank you, Mike. And there's a reason I've asked Miss Mike to do that. And you'll see when I get further on into the lesson. Um, we had, uh, there are 12 disciples, you know, and of course, when Jesus was on the cross, one had um, betrayed him, and that was Judas. And of course, he had uh, taken his life. So there were 11 remaining disciples, and we'll make, we may mention those as we go along. But I want to talk about who was at the crucifixion, who was at the burial of Jesus, who was at the empty tomb. And this is very important that we think about this because it was, um, it was women who were there. It was women. We don't, we don't hardly hear anything about men. There's one man that's mentioned. Uh, so it was women. There were women there who had followed Jesus from a distance. And John was there, the disciple. He was the only disciple that we have recorded as being there when Jesus was crucified. And John was the only, he was the only one that we know about. But John's mother was also there. And so I'm going to go over those people who were there. But so why were the other disciples not there? They were afraid. They had kind of dispersed and, um, and left because they were fearful that they might be next in line to be arrested. But for some reason, John was not fearful. Maybe because his mother was there, maybe he felt like, okay, if anything happens, I, you know, I want to make sure I'm there with my mom. I don't know. But of the women who followed Jesus, a lot of them were there. We meant, uh, the Bible mentions there some of their names. And of those women who followed Jesus, some had been healed of evil spirits. Some had been healed of sicknesses. Uh, there were some that had followed Jesus that were supporters of his. They supported him financially. Um, they also, while he was in the Galilee area, when he was ministering in that area, they would minister to him. I, I guess that means they probably brought him food and the disciples food, and they kind of tried to help meet their needs. But all of these women, you'd consider them disciples of Jesus. They were followers of Jesus. So the men, women who are named are, are these women. It was the Mary Magdalene, and she's always mentioned. And that's, that's interesting, too. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her sister, were, these are the ones who are at the crucifixion that are mentioned. So we, this is the only time I've ever heard Mary's sister being mentioned. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. Now, this was this was James um, the Less or the Lesser. He, he was another disciple. There were two disciples named James, but this is the one, the one that we know most about. So his mom was there, and then uh, Salome, the mother of James and John, were there. This is the James that we recognize that wrote the book of James. So it was James and John. And then at the burial, you know, we know that there was Joseph and then there was Nicodemus because they, they were allowed to take the body of Jesus down to take and put it in a, in a, in a grave that Joseph, that Joseph owned and had never been used before. So the women who followed them to see what was going on, it was Mary Magdalene. There we have Mary again, that Mary. And it was also Mary, the mother of the, James, the one that was lesser known. And then at the empty tomb that Sunday morning, there was a group of women. And those who were named were, again, there we go, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. That's the James we were talking about. Salome, the mother of James and John. And then there's another uh, lady that's mentioned. Her name is Joanna. And it mentions her. Uh, in the New Testament or in some of the book uh, gospels that she actually helped finance Jesus' ministry. But she was the wife of Herod's steward. So those people are mentioned as being at the empty tomb. So 
I'd ask the question, but it's hard to get y'all responses in this kind of um, environment. But Mary Magdalene was singled out by the writers, every one of them, as an eyewitness to all these events. She was at the cross. She followed them to the tomb to see where they were, what were they doing with Jesus' body. She went to the empty to the, to the tomb on Sunday morning and found that it was empty. When Jesus, uh, when they found the tomb was empty, Jesus spoke to them. And he singled out Mary when he spoke to them. So I think the reason for that is Mary had a, probably a leadership role among those women, just like Peter had. You know, Jesus had done an amazing thing for Mary Magdalene. He said that he had cast out seven demons from her. So that was significant. Now, the events at the tomb, I want to talk a little bit about the events that took place at the tomb. So here we talked about the crucifixion, the burial, the empty tomb, who was there. But I want to talk about what happened on that Sunday morning. What were the events that took place on that Sunday morning? So, and I just took the scriptures and I kind of bullet pointed these things out. And early, it was early on Sunday morning after the sun had come up. They had gathered up these spices and things to put on the body, which was the tradition to do. And on their way, they begin to ask the question, who will roll the stone away? Because Mary Magdalene had seen that stone or the stone that was going to be put in place or the stone that had been put in place. And so they began to ask that question when they went. Of course, there were no men with them. Don't know why they didn't. Some of the disciples didn't come with them because they came from the same place that everybody had gathered. Um, and when they got there, they discovered that stone that was blocking the entrance had been rolled away or had been moved. And then Mary Magdalene gets down and she looks in the grave and she finds that it's empty. And so these women, they encountered the angels. And there were two angels. In some gospels, it says two angels. Some says it just mentions one. But they were dressed in white. And it says they were dazzling. They were glowing. Those, those garments were shimmering. Uh, and the women, just like when anybody sees an angel in the Bible, they're terrified. It's, it's obviously um, an experience that, you know, is, is just not normal. You know, it, it's, it's not normal. And so that really shocked them. And so they were terrified by that. So I want to talk a little bit about what the angel said. What the angel said. Is this the first thing they said? Don't be afraid. And remember, when Mary, the mother of Jesus, the angel appealed to her, what did the angel tell her? Don't be afraid. You know, because they know that because of the suddenness of it, maybe their appearance, they know that people have a fear when they see them. And he said, I know who you're looking for. And another thing that they said, the angels say, this has come from several different of the Gospels. Another thing that they said was said is, why do you seek the living one among the dead? The next thing they said is, he's not here, he is risen. And the third thing they said, come see the place where he was lying. You know, just, uh, just to know that he's gone, he's not there anymore, you know. You know, the, you, why do you seek the one among the living, um, or one living among the dead? That's because he was, the, the angel was basically saying, he's not dead anymore. He is alive. He is risen. And the fourth thing he told them to do is go quickly and tell the disciples and Peter that he's risen from the dead. The interesting thing here is that the only place it says, and Peter, is in the book of Mark. And you may not know this, but the book of Mark is probably, uh, it was probably dictated by Peter to Mark because Mark was uh, very close to Peter. Peter often calls him like his son. So that's the only gospel that mentions Peter by name. Go quickly and tell his disciples and Peter. So I think Peter kind of wrote himself into the, into the gospel there. And then number five, it says, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. This is talking about Jesus. This is where Jesus told them that he would come and meet with them. And so the angel gives them direction to give to the, to the disciples, go ahead into Galilee, 
at a, at, you know, a particular place or area. And that's where Jesus would come and, and meet with them. So then in, in the Luke's gospel, it continues the dialogue with the angels. And it says, remember how he spoke to you. He said, the son of man must. And this is what Jesus had said. And he was reminding them of what Jesus would say. He said, he's going to be betrayed and rested, arrested. Jesus had said he was going to be crucified. Jesus said on the third day he would rise again. So the angel just began to remind them of what Jesus said. And then it says in Luke 24, it says, and they remembered his words. And they realized, began to realize what had happened. You know, they had to be overcome by emotion. And so they did. They left the tomb quickly. They were still trembling and astonished. Uh, but I'm sure they were joyful at the same time. And they ran to the disciples, the 11 that were gathered. Plus, there were other people that were gathered there, too. And they ran and began to uh, to go and tell them that. And, the, and during that time or somewhere in this period of time, they ran into Jesus. And, and they didn't recognize him at first. And then when he spoke, they recognized him. And it says in one of the Gospels, it says that he first appeared to Mary Magdalene. And they came up and it says they took hold of his feet. They fell at his feet, began to worship him. And, and Jesus said, they were weeping, okay? And Jesus said to them, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? He told them again. He told them, don't be afraid. Go take the word to my brethren or to the disciples to leave and go to Galilee. And there they'll see me. So it was very similar to what the angel had said. And so Mary and these other women, they went and reported those things to the disciples. But it says that they were weeping when they were trying to tell the disciples they were just weeping. So they were very emotional. And what Mary said, is, is the only thing it quotes her as saying in any of the Gospels, it says, I have seen the Lord. See, that was proof that the Lord had risen. And she relayed that message that the angels had told her tell the disciples and the despite the disciples response really kind of sad they refused to believe it because that could never happen even though they had seen Lazarus rise from the dead you know they they just thought that could never happen and they thought that maybe um, it was nonsense that's kind of what the scripture says they thought it was nonsense but Peter and John they had to go see for themselves that the tomb was empty. And they ran and they stooped and they looked in and they saw the linens that he had been wrapped in. And then it just says that he went home and he was marveling at what happened. But see, I don't think that he knew. I don't think that he knew uh, what really had taken place. I want to share with you this, this song. That's my favorite Easter song. I think it's by far my favorite Easter song. It's called um, it's called Easter Song. That's exactly what it's called. And it's done by second chapter of Acts. It goes back to the mid-70s. So just bear with me while I play this just, just a couple minutes long. Stones in the knee is free. 
So why do you seek the living among the dead? Dead. Why, why was that? It's because Jesus Christ is no longer dead. Just like that song says, he is no longer dead. He's alive. Remember, uh, remember what Jesus said. I mean, the angel said, remember that, that he must be betrayed and arrested, that he would be crucified. And the third day he would rise again. And he told the disciples, he told them to go and tell the disciples, go quickly and tell them. And they did just that. So I want to talk just a little bit about why, what's the significance of women being the first to know. And this is very important. It's very important. God chose women to herald in the most significant event in history. And that was Jesus' resurrection. The angels told them to say he's risen, that he's alive. They were the, actually the first ones to see the resurrected Jesus. They were commissioned to go and tell about Jesus. So they were the first ones commissioned. Their discovery of Jesus and the empty tomb was not incidental. It was intentional. It was what God willed. And you got to remember that in the first century, and it's not just in the first century, but definitely in the first century, women were not even allowed to be witnesses in a legal proceeding. So you see how significant that is? The women were told to go give the testimony of what they were had seen to be the witness. Yet in that time, women weren't even accepted as witnesses in, le in legal stuff. So be the first to testify of Jesus' resurrection was significant. How have women been treated throughout history? Think about this a minute. Women have been persecuted. They've been abused. They've been oppressed. They've been enslaved. They've been mistreated. And they generally, generally not given the same rights as men. I mean, think about this. It was only 100 years ago in 1920 that women were given the right to vote in the United States. I mean, that's pretty recent history when you think about it. But Jesus, he always treated women with the same respect that he treated men with. He did not look down at them. He did not mistreat them. He healed them. He had discussions with them. In fact, just like I mentioned before, women supported his ministry. So he, he considered women on the same level as men, which normally wasn't done back then. Jesus' message, what he was preaching, what he was teaching, the kingdom of God, that grace, the salvation, the eternal life, it was for Jew and Greek. It was for male and female. It was for rich and poor. Jesus broke down the barrier of division. And I want to read through these scriptures here. For he himself is our peace who made both groups. Now here he's talking about Jew and Gentile. But you can say man and woman. You can say poor and rich. You can use whatever contrast you want to. But he broke those walls down. He broke that barrier down or that dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. One new person. It says man, but we know it's, it's one person. And then we see this in Luke 4, 18. Jesus came to set people free. It doesn't say men only. It says people free. It doesn't say Jews only. It's to set the people free. It does mention the poor here pretty much. But anyway, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed, who are oppressed. And then Jesus, this Galatians 3, we'll see this. Jesus came to remove any barrier that existed between race, gender, and social status. Galatians 3, we read this, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. And here it is, there is neither male 
nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So women were present not only at these times we just talked about, you know, during the Jesus re, uh, crucifixion and all the way through to the resurrection, when men were not present, except for we read, you know, where John was present. Um, women were present in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. There were 120 people gathered then. Women were used by God throughout the Bible. And in the growth of the New Testament church, we read about a lot of different women who were involved. In contrast to the, remember those first century traditions, testimony of women weren't valued, they, but yet they were the first to testify of Jesus' resurrection. They were the first to say he is risen. And they were given that task of going and communicating that to the disciples. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the significance of the resurrection, the significance of the resurrection. The disciples, and remember they were in disbelief when they heard about Jesus, when they heard that he, was, he wasn't dead, that he was, his, his body wasn't in the grave. Uh, they were shocked. They were shocked by what they heard. Even though Jesus has been telling them over and over again, they were just shocked by it because all of this that happened to Jesus, just not what they had imagined. Um, and even though Peter and John had seen the empty tomb, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure any of the disciples believed until they actually saw Jesus themselves. And when Jesus, I want you to think about this just a minute. When Jesus took on human flesh, and this may be a little different for some to grasp, and some of you may say, well, David, I already knew this, but... It's just, it's just something that I've come to realize maybe in the last few years, but Jesus gave up his heavenly form when he took on the fleshly body. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he was resurrected in what? He was resurrected in a glorified body. So I believe Jesus eternally traded whatever his heavenly form was for that glorified body. And that's significant because Jesus gave up maybe more than we might have thought. He didn't just come here to earth and die and resurrect and everything's back the way it was. That's not what it was. It says Jesus had a glorified body just like we will have in the resurrection. And Jesus is the only person that has been resurrected for eternity. And we know Lazarus was raised from the dead and there's some other people that were raised from the dead that we've read about in the New Testament. It's probably happened over time. Too, where God has raised people from the dead, but eventually they would die again. So Jesus is the only person to ever have been resurrected into that glorified body. Our resurrection or transformation will not happen when we die. It'll happen when Jesus comes the second time in his second coming. You know, we believe in the resurrection. We believe in eternal life. We believe in the hope, what we call the hope of glory. We believe in more than just this physical existence. And if not for the resurrection, our faith would be in vain. And I want to end with this scripture here. And it's in 1 Corinthians. And it's Paul's defense. It's Paul's defense of the resurrection. Because he was talking, he was sending this to some of the Corinthians had maybe began to express some belief or somebody had some teaching to come around that the resurrection is just um, isn't real. It's not. It's not true. You know, we're not really gonna going to uh, be resurrected from the dead. We're not going to live eternally. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You know, when we take the Bible in all its context, we know that every soul lives eternal. You're either going to be live separated from God, or you're going to be live with Christ and with God. So here's Paul's defense of that. And it's several verses, but I got it broken down and hopefully you can follow it. He says, if we have told you that Christ has been brought back to life, how can some of you say that coming back from the dead is impossible? If the dead can't be brought back to life, then Christ hasn't come back to life. Yet we know, I'm, I'm interjecting this, we know that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead 
just to demonstrate his power over death. And it says, if Christ hasn't come back to life, our message has no meaning. And your faith also has no meaning. You know, there's people who don't believe in, in the afterlife, in the resurrection. They believe that when you die, you just die. And I don't see how those people have any hope in, in living their life. Then he continues, in addition, we are obviously witnesses who lied about God. That is, if Jesus didn't really resurrect from the dead, because we testify that he brought Christ back to life. But if it's true that the dead don't come back to life, then God really didn't bring Christ back to life, which we know he did. Certainly, if the dead can't come back to life, then Christ hasn't come back to life either. If Christ hasn't come back to life, your faith is worthless, and sin still has you in its power. Then those who have died as believers in Christ no longer exist. If Christ is our hope in this life only, we deserve more pity than any other people. But he says, but now Christ has come back from the dead. He is alive. He has risen. He is the first person of those who have died to come back to life. That is in that glorified body. He says, since a man, and that's talking about Adam and Eve, brought death, a man, being Jesus, also brought life back from death. As everyone dies because of Adam, so also everyone will be made alive because of Christ. This will happen to each person in his own turn. Christ is the first. Then at his coming, a second coming, those who belong to him will be made alive. Then the end will come. Christ will hand over the kingdom to, to God the Father as he destroys every ruler, ruler, authority, and power. He is risen. You know, Jesus... Jesus' resurrection is the most significant event in, in our belief in, in what is the truth. It's the most significant event. And I don't think it's any mistake that he had women be the first to testify to that. 